incredibly biased towards only one thing, which was white, male, heterosexuals. That was it, as far as the art world was concerned. And there were groups like the Gorilla Girls who took that on as their battle, as their challenge. Now, we know, of course, there were great feminists working all through the century. But I think the, in the 1970s and 80s, when I came of age, when I was a baby curator, we, we entered a second phase. It went beyond the kind of protest into asserting a different aesthetic sensibility, which wasn't directly didactic or uh, about a kind of agitprop. It was actually uh, evolving a new aesthetic, a new language, which was specific to all those different constituencies that had been excluded. And again, we're talking about queer politics, about identity politics uh, in general. Um, so, looking at the Whitechapel Gallery, look at this, isn't it? Fantastic roll call. So, even as early as 1916, uh, women were present, but look at that first title, it's Mothercraft. So, women were designated definitely to being mothers and to applied arts, to decorative arts. That was definitely seen as our arena, and therefore secondary. But actually, things improved through the century, and now, I think, we could truly say that in terms of exhibition spaces, there is parity. Now, part of the um, initiative that has helped change things are, of course, women artists themselves. And I just wanted to show you a few of the great historic moments when uh, women challenged all sorts of things, sculpture, painting, of course, uh, they took photography, Cindy Sherman used photography in a completely new way, also in a performative way where the artist's body became subject and object. Kiki Smith, um, Rosemary Trockel, an incredibly eclectic and protean artist who looks at psychoanalysis as well as uh, feminist politics and sculpture. Um, Nan Golden, the great photographer, who of course pictured many her, her world. Uh, all the gay friends who, of course, were hit by the HIV-AIDS uh, epidemic in the 1980s. So all of these bodies of works were representations of otherness, if you like. Um, Sophie Cal, the great French artist, and I'm focusing just on, on my institution. Uh, Alice Neal rediscovered uh, posthumously, Gillian Waring, Rachel Whiteread, who we have a permanent work on the exterior of the building, Zarina Bimji, and Sarah Lucas, and Hannah Hock, also recently rediscovered. So, part of that story um, is shared, of course, in Britain and around the world. What hasn't quite caught up, however, is, interestingly enough, the marketplace. And it's true to say that women still command lower prices than male artists. Um, and in the broader fields, uh, architecture, for example, men out, uh, there are more men by a ratio of, I think, 100 to 1. So there are still great battles to be fought in the visual culture of our world today. And as a consequence of that, we formed a partnership with a uh, fashion house called Max Mara. And they're an interesting group because they were started in the 1950s by a tailor. And he recognized that industrialization could bring quality to a mass market. He was really interested in women's clothing, but knew that only the most prosperous Italian women could afford tailored, beautiful coats and, and, and outfits. And he wanted to deploy the, the, the kind of Henry Ford model of the factory to bring great quality to a much wider market of women. Max Mara have always designed for women. They've always used women designers. And they're a, they're a local factory. They make their, their works in Reggio Emilia in northern Italy. Their founder, uh, the senior Maramotti, Alberto Maramotti, also began to collect art. And they, over the last... 40 years have built up an extraordinary collection, which is also in Reggio Emilia. His son Luigi took over and grew the business, so it became a global company, but still with a commitment to, to women. And we formed a partnership about eight years ago. 
And Max Mara wanted to raise their visibility in Britain. They wanted to do it through art. And together we decided to make a prize which offered a residency for emerging women artists. Now, when I say emerging, I don't necessarily mean young, because as we know, uh, those of you who have seen the breathtaking Phyllida Barlow show at Tate Britain at the moment, Phyllida waited many decades to be recognized. She's actually 70, but has finally made it. Um, so it's really not about the age, but really about visibility. One of the things that we recognize that women, of course, struggle with is finding an economy, a way of surviving after they've graduated from art school. There's that terrifying moment when you're stepping out into the void. How are you going to make a living? How do you reconcile making a living with having a family? How do you find a studio? Um, I mean, of course, that's a shared problem, but the studio spaces in London are in challenging locations. You know, if you're leaving at one o'clock in the morning from Hackney Wick, I can tell you it's a, scary, it's a scary area and there's no public transport. There are all sorts of issues like that. But then also, once you get representation, you are guaranteed to earn less than your male colleagues, I'm afraid to say. So all of these things made it feel important that we offered something to women at that crucial moment in the, in the development of their careers. So what we gave them I, is possibly the most valuable thing of all. We gave them time. And we did it through offering a six months residency. Oh, this, by the way, is the Maramotti collection. And if you're ever in Northern Italy, I would highly recommend a visit. It's, it's in their former factory and it's quite extraordinary. So the Ma Max Mara Art Prize for Women is chosen by a jury of our peers. And we decided to invite the gatekeepers. We invited an artist, a gallerist, a critic, and a collector. Each year, those four constituencies come together, and each one of those nominates five artists that they're really excited about, who haven't had a major solo show, who haven't had representation. We have a day of the most extraordinary deliberations. The judges are passionate, and they are champions for their five artists. So we really get full immersion in that kind of in their world and how they interpret their art. And at the end of that process, we, choose, we shortlist four artists, and then we invite them and we say, do you want to go and spend six months in Italy? Some of them say, no, I'm too busy, or whatever it is. But so far, everybody's been very keen, and they come and then we interview them and ask, what would you do? And we offer them three months in Rome, in the... Uh, academy and then three months in a location of their choice it could be in the countryside it could be anywhere in Italy and I think from Maramotti's uh, from Mr. Maramotti's point of view it's replicating the idea of the grand tour you know so many people traveled around Italy in the 18th 19th early 20th centuries being inspired by its great historic legacies contemporary artists are looking at Italy today so it's a wonderful opportunity at the end of it, the artist is asked to create a work inspired by their experience. We premiere that at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, and then it enters the Maramotti collection. So it's a whole process from travel and research to creation to presentation to acquisition. The other great thing about the prize is, okay, there's only one winner, but 20 artists are seen by the gatekeepers of the art world. They're seen by collectors, they're seen by critics, by gallerists. So as a consequence of that process, they found, even if they didn't win, they actually found themselves galleries or had shows. So it's been a kind of win-win situation for us all. And I was just going to show the winners. So Margaret Salmon, who as a consequence of this prize, uh, was shown at the Venice Biennale the following year. Hannah Ricards, who's gained residencies in Canada and uh, Europe. Andrea Butner, whose work you can see today at Tate Britain, and who, as a consequence of the prize, was included in Document 13. And Law Provost, who, of course, as a result of her Max Mara residency, was nominated and won the 2013 Turner Prize. And this year, a great artist called Corinne Swan, 
Canadian living in England, studied in Glasgow, is in Italy as we speak. Um, and she's using the Commedia dell'arte as her site of inspiration. Um, so we feel very proud of this prize and we think it's making an important contribution. Um, I wanted to just close my presentation by making an observation, which was in autumn 2013, we had here in London a show of uh, Dianita Singh from India. We had Anna Mendieta from Chile. We had Aisha Erkman from Turkey. Uh, we had Mara Shandell from Brazil, all at the same time. We had an African-American artist, Cara Walker, at the Camden Art Center. And we had a white working class artist called Sarah Lucas at the Whitechapel Gallery, all at the same time. Not one reviewer said, oh, it's women's art. Not one reviewer cited ethnicity or gender. All the reviews were about these artists as artists. So we've come a long way since 1979. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I hope that this prize continues to change consciousness and give women artists the, the space and the recognition that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivana. I was going to say, well, uh, the, what the White Chapel has achieved is a, a sure proof of the benefits of a militant um, uh, art, but then you, you conclude by saying that it may no longer be required, so I guess that will uh, be a good starting point for our conversation. But in your case, Lulu, you are coming from a, a region, one of the regions of the world that is the most polarized at the moment, mm -hmm. and where censorship is still uh, very much strife, mm -hmm. and also a region of the world where there is um, there has been a certain uh, proliferation of uh, cultural uh, initiatives, of uh, art centers, of institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, therefore, uh, this question of being uh, militant or non-militant is particularly um, uh, sort of valid. And it would be wonderful to hear you, your experience sure. in Dubai. Hello, and sorry. Kuwait. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me on this panel. Um, um, well, yes, you know, uh, the West, of course, have had an, an, uh, a developed art market for quite some time. And in the Middle East, we have a very emerging market. And some places like Iraq and Egypt and the Levant are a lot more developed than the Gulf region. The Gulf region has a lot more um, uh, spotlight on them because they're building these institutions. Um, and one of the things that, one of the things that, you know, concerns me is, is that what we don't want is to have, you know, uh, only Western practices and pseudo-Western art spaces. Um, for example, just, just because it's in my mind because it happened recently, um, in Doha there's the Katani Center which is closing down. Now that, that center was uh, established by a friend of mine to um, promote emerging and established artists just from the Gulf region. And, uh, and the budget was $300,000 a year, so not so much. Um, and they have to close down because of lack of fun funding in a country that spends millions on bringing these big name Western artists and building these massive museums. So, you, so of course, I mean, I'm the first one who was very happy to hear that a lot of these museums are opening. I don't have to take my kid to Paris to, to see big shows. They can just go a step away. But at the same time, you know, a lot needs to be done from the grassroots level and from a, a, and a different way of thinking and to honor what's, what's happening locally uh, and, and put that into perspective. On the other side, of course, you know, where the environment is completely different. I mean, when I come to London, you know, I recently went to a David Bailey photography show and, you know, you see you know, you see subjects completely naked and no one bats an eyelash. Um, for me, when I, um, when I was uh, participating in Art 14 recently, I showed a work of a Yemeni photographer who's gay. And it wasn't, okay, it was a little bit out there, but I certainly couldn't show that work in Kuwait or in Dubai. And so I used that opportunity to show this work. Um, of course, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's always very clever ways to talk about social and political situations that is not in your face, and a lot of artists do that. Some artists take it too far and get 
and pay the consequences, and I can discuss some examples of that. Um, you have uh, a Saudi Arabian artist, uh, her name is Manal Dwayan, and she is really in the frontier of activist art, and, um, and she goes about things in a very, very interesting way. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Um, in Saudi Arabia, as you know, women can't drive, um, and instead of going about it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that's just going to stop the discussion, um, talking about how stupid it is, how backwards, we all know that how stupid and backwards it is. How she went about it was she did um, um, a residency in Doha at the museum and she, uh, she entitled it Crash, talking about all the teachers that have to travel to remote areas to teach and because they can't drive they have to take these dr male drivers that some of them don't know how to drive, some of them are using old bad vehicles and then she charts the deaths of these teachers and how many die per year as a result of this law. One example. Two exa another example, um, please note where I can, Kuwait is not like Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is the only country that's like this. Um, uh, women cannot travel without a male, you know, um, sponsor or chaperone, etc. Uh, until she's 50, by the way, because then she's not considered a threat. Um, <laughs> And so, so what she, uh, so what Manal Dwayan did is she had um, these birds, you know, and she made these birds in flight. Uh, it was actually acquired by the Matahaf Museum in Doha, and uh, where she, where she had the, you know, you had, she, she did a project. She said, so "Who will show me, give, show me their papers and submit their papers so I can scan them, so I can use them for this project with birds of flight." And she was astounded by the numbers that came in, wanted to talk. Also, like people don't talk about, they don't say women's names. They say like the mother of this you know this you know the daughter of the etc they don't say her actual name in conversation um, so she had another project where she had women write down their names you know um, and so and, and and people discuss it so you know and this is where I feel artists in the Middle East can really instigate change I mean I'm just giving her one example of this particular artist but there are many and um, and again you know just like in the West you know it's it's the women artists are, are not, there's this cultural idea in some places, of course it depends from family to family, but um, you know, oh great, you're an artist, okay, that sounds great, but what about when you get married and have children? It's gonna be like a hobby, or are you still gonna do it? Mm -hmm. No, seriously, and it's like, it's, so, I mean, this is how it is, even though it's a five and a half hour flight, you know, to, or six hours to Dubai, it's completely different. We have a long way to go. Maybe could you, uh, going back a bit, uh, tell us about JAM, about the mission of JAM and why you founded it and oh, what sure. you're uh, uh, sure. hoping to achieve? Um, well, I was, uh, I was the um, Middle East director for Philip Superior and Company uh, and I did a show here, the first uh, show that uh, Saatchi did on um, contemporary Arab and Iranian art. I, I um, curated the, an exhibition of modern arts because I, uh, at the Philip Superior room because I wanted to show people where this art came from, you know, so I had works that go back even a hundred years. Um, and I included uh, three women and one of the, one of the artists, Madiha Omar, I mean, it was really hard to get a work by her, but I really wanted not to show male artists, uh, like show Samia Halibi, show, show really Etla Adnan from Lebanon. I mean, I had maybe four women, like a survey of works. Uh, after that, um, because I was, uh, you know, uh, I, w I was supposed to start contemporary art auctions in Dubai, but because of the crisis, I decided I, I wasn't able to do that anymore, so I decided to set up my own company. Um, before I was a gallery, I was more of an art consultancy, so I was working between London and, uh, and the Middle East uh, on projects, so we would do pop-up shows, etc. Uh, and then I was doing also a contemporary art auction in Kuwait every year, mostly Middle Eastern art, but I always had international art because I don't believe, you know, an artist is an artist first before their nationality. And I, and of course, you know, it's important, especially in emerging markets, to have collectors from the region. But uh, ultimately, you know, a lot of artists don't want to be just uh, identified by the, the region they're from. Um, and now we, I have a physical space in Dubai, and now I'm just a, an art gallery. Way early days, not, nothing like you, but you know, well, you're so the kind of gallery that I aspire to become. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Perfect. And uh, can you mention some of the programs that you have had late, recently mm -hmm. at, uh, at JAM? Mm -hmm. um, well, we just signed on a, an Iranian artist, uh, Amir Hossein Sanjani, who is, uh, when I f heard the title of this, um, uh, of this lecture, I really thought it was about military and art. So <laughs> I did have a presentation of his works when he talks about 
the military. Um, and we've shown works by uh, emerging artists from the region, uh, also some international artists like Bert Stern with his works on Marilyn Monroe. Um, I mean, a, a, mixed, a mixed bag, really. Uh, right now we're moving to a new location, which is great because it's where a lot of other galleries are located in the industrial area. Because when you're by yourself, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a tough market. People have to really go out there to, just for you. And, but when you're in a community of galleries, just like they have in New York and other, in certain 